Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar provided by RHEL Central. I'm Emma Espel, and I'm a researcher with RHEL Central. I'll be serving as a facilitator for the session today, and I will also contribute some to the presentation about the RHEL Central study. The webinar today is focused on a report that was recently published and disseminated nationally through the Institute of Education Sciences. Not only do we have the report author here, Steve Meyer, to present with us, we also have some additional experts and collaborators to provide additional information about the context of this field, experiences in teacher preparation, and in Missouri. This webinar is meant to provide information about teacher candidate field experiences, research related to field experiences in teacher preparation, expectations for field experiences in Missouri, and the context for the RHEL Central Study in addition to some results from the study um, in Missouri and discussion around implications of the study and critical project-based clinical experiences. Dr. Meyer is a senior research associate at RMC Research in Denver, Colorado and serves as the director of research and evaluation for the regional education laboratories in the central state. As part of RHEL Central, he also leads a cross-state research alliance focused on effective teacher preparation. Um, in addition to that work, Dr. Meyer also directs an evaluation of the Teach Detroit project, which is an urban teacher residency program. The evaluation examines outcomes for participating teacher candidates, their mentors, and the elementary and middle school students they serve. And um, in addition to that, Dr. Meyer serves as a What Works Clearinghouse reviewer for evidence reviews on various topics. In, in developing the teacher preparation work, um, these are some of the priorities that emerged when we started to convene the alliance and, and uh, lay out our scope of work. So we were, there was an interest among uh, constituents in our region to identify um, essentially kind of what works in educator preparation and inform and develop um, that literature base. Um, develop, there's been a real uh, push for accountability in educator preparation, which we'll hear, hear a little more about. And there was an interest in developing some common indicators to look at program effectiveness and also to inform improvement. And then finally, to conduct research that would um, look at implementation of programs and their impact. Uh, so there are three kind of areas of work that we've done uh, related to teacher preparation. The first is technical assistance. So just to give you a sense of the kinds of supports we provided in this area, we've done some work to help states develop and implement teacher candidate performance assessment tools. So we did a validity and reliability study in Missouri and also developed a scoring tool um, to help improve reliability of a, a teacher candidate performance assessment in Kansas. Um, and there's some other examples here. These are a couple of research projects that we did with RHEL Central. The first um, was a look at, in each of the seven states in our region, what sort of um, work has been done and is underway to evaluate teacher preparation programs. Um, so that's the report on the left. Um, it basically summarizes kind of what was, what was in place and what was underway in the region. And on the right is the report we'll be talking more about today. This was a study of first-year teachers in Missouri looking at the field experiences. And um, both of these reports are publicly available via the IES website, and there's a link at the bottom of the slide. Our next section will focus on an overview of the field of teacher preparation and field experiences. I'd like to welcome our presenters, Drs. Christian Zenkov and Christine Paitash. Um, Christian is a professor of education at George Mason University, and in this role he serves as a hybrid educator working across school, university, and community contexts as a teacher, teacher educator, and activist. He uses participatory action research approaches and photo voice methods, co-directing the Through Students' Eyes project and engaging with youth and pre- and in-service teachers. Through this, they explore big ideas and big questions. And that includes notions of literacy, exceptional teaching, citizenship, and justice. He is the author and editor of more than 140 articles and book chapters and six books that focus on teacher education, literacy, social justice education, and school-university partnerships. A veteran English teacher, he continues to co-teach and co-research at T.C. Williams with multiple teachers and youth. He's presenting today with Dr. Christine Paitash, an associate professor in teaching, learning, and curriculum studies at Kent State University's College of Education, Health, and Human Services. Here she co-directs co -directs the secondary integrated language arts 
Teacher Preparation Program. She was a former high school English teacher, and her research focuses on the literacy practices of youth in alternative schools and juvenile de detention facilities, disciplinary writing, and preparing teachers to teach writing. Her recent work has appeared in multiple journals. In addition, she facilitates a weekly writing workshop for youth at a juvenile detention facility. So welcome to our two presenters who are going to talk about the overview of the field. Thank you, Emma. Chrissy and I have the, the really wonderful opportunity just to talk a bit about the national context of clinical experiences and field experiences, and then also later in this webinar to share more about some specific innovations, some practices that, that we've devised and that we're currently implementing and studying. But um, I thought we thought we'd give you just a bit of background first. Um, it doesn't take much research uh, to, to identify the numerous research reports and professional association position statements from all manner of author, all manner of practitioner. That to, to really address the, or I should say that are that are addressing the need for more extended and coherent, relevant clinical experiences. I think uh, many of us teacher educators feel fortunate that 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 literature is coming from from all angles. And, um, some some of these folks, practitioners, scholars, policymakers, have gone so far as to suggest that. Clinical experiences should really be at the center of teacher education efforts, which uh, we don't find to be a radical claim at all. It's actually something we're grateful for. Uh, maybe a bit more interesting is the fact that um, uh, more of these professional associations and scholars are really uh, urging that all constituents of teacher preparation programs in schools should be actively involved in these efforts. And that's really, that speaks to the innovation that uh, Chris and I are going to speak to later, which is um, those of us who are traditionally university-based teacher educators really being involved across contexts. Um, I should say, kind of give credit where credit is due, that many of these organizations, individuals, and reports point to NKATE's 2010 Blue Ribbon Panel uh, report on clinical preparation as really the highest profile call and uh, I guess really a rallying cry for this pivot towards clinical experiences. Though it, it's interesting that uh, the responses to the Blue Ribbon report haven't been so coordinated as to be considered direct reactions to the report. And so really what that means is that these um, cries, these calls, these, um, you know, uh, just nudging us towards clinical experience are bubbling up. They're not just uh, uh, reactions. But I will say the sheer number and range of voices being raised in support of making clinical practice the central feature of our work just makes it so that they can't be ignored. Um, and again, for those of us who are doing this work, um, we're, I think we're really just, uh, again, grateful that, uh, that there are so many voices speaking to it. Um, so as Christiana alluded to, we also have to be cautious as we start to question why so many of the findings and the recommendations from those reports haven't always been acknowledged or haven't found their way necessarily into the foundations of our operations as teacher educators. Um, so these recent reports really thoroughly detail the nature of pre-service teachers' learning in particular contexts and across these particular ranges of contexts. Uh, both scholarly and professional associations, they highlight the centrality of these early field experiences, not only in the pedagogies that teachers uh, develop and adopt, but their orientation to the profession and to their practice in the classroom. So while we know that university coursework, the methods, courses that pre-service teachers take, it provides them with this exposure to cutting-edge research-based practices um, and how they should consider and implement um, these practices, those have to be aligned to the field experiences so that the field experiences and the university coursework um, they're wedded together um, so that teachers are having coherent experiences across contexts. So one of the dirty little secrets of this work is that the challenges to this clinical experience orientation are numerous. Um, and sometimes they take the form of individuals who have been really doing the work for a long time. They also just take the form of established traditions, roles, and structures of our field. Um, the, um, it, sadly, the, uh, the um, calls for a consideration of clinical elements of teacher education as the core of teacher educators' work can easily be muffled by the reality that real disconnects still exist 
on a day-to-day -day basis between the university courses where pre-service teachers uh, learn much of what they will eventually implement and the field experiences where they're going to get a chance to um, to test those things out. The, the, the tradition, sadly, again, is that uh, it's often represented by an us versus them orientation. I'm afraid that a lot of uh, new teachers, even better teachers, are aware of it, that we have that orientation in our field ra rather than a recognition that school-based educators, or, you know, classroom teachers, are actually school-based teacher educators and they really have to be recognized as, as such. That this divide has traditionally been framed as something of an anti-intellectual one with university faculty being per perceiving what actually happens in schools to be in direct opposition to what theoretically should be hap happening. Um, perhaps most troubling in these traditions is, that, is the fact that field experiences, the point of our conversation today, have too often been relegated to hours completion tasks, kind of box checking sorts of things, and teacher candidate observations of the most willing rather than the most exceptional veteran teachers. And just as an example, the, we consider mentor selection to be one of the primary things on which we need to focus next. Um, but the result, based on current models, is that there are a lot of uh, missed opportunities for future teachers' reflections on pedagogies rather than, um, uh, rather than on the practices that they might engage in. And I, the bit more of a backdrop to this is the reality that uh, our schools, our students are becoming increasingly diverse, and so the need for more responsive context and individually relevant instruction is even more pressing. So we start to think about this as the risks. What happens when field experiences are um, disconnected and limited? And, and really what we're finding is that there is research that shows that pre-service teachers, when they transition into full-time full employment, when they are in the classroom full-time, um, they often enter the profession ready just to replicate the status quo. Um, that their professional survival during these years really limits their abilities to consider alternative practices. And as it was alluded to, this is particularly problematic when we think about the consistent and dramatic shifts in our school student populations. Yeah. Um, so we can kind of, it makes sense, it's reasonable to think that entry year and early year teachers would have the ideals to serve these evolving demographics but they might lack the experience to match the pedagogies to the principals. And we've also been documenting, um, education scholars have documented how these critical orientations to teaching, how we want teachers to be able to reflect on, to revise, to make their pedagogies responsive, that's difficult for them to do if they're transitioning into the profession particularly when there are these disconnected experiences between what was happening in their university-based theoretical training and their preparation, and then the everyday clinical realities of the classroom. Thanks so much. That was a great overview of what is going on, where we'd like to be, and what the research is saying about um, the context of field experiences in teacher preparation. I'd like to move next to talking about the education pre educator preparation context in Missouri specifically. And in order to do so, I'm I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Hap Hairston. He will provide information about um, the Missouri context. We've been working with HAP on a number of different projects over the course of the REL Central contract. And um, so it's, it's our pleasure to introduce him as part of this project as well. He has been with the Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education since the fall of 2007. And his previous experience includes eight years in educator preparation and 27 years in Missouri's PK through 12 schools. As a member of the um, DESE Office of Educator Quality, Hap has been working in partnership with his colleagues and 55 preparation programs, as well as various professional associations, in order to build Missouri's model of continuous improvement for all educators. His presentations include local, state, and national audiences. So welcome to Hap, um, who I think is joining from uh, educator preparation institution today. Yes, well thank you Emma. 
Uh, yeah, it, 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 it's a pleasure to uh, join you today and appreciate the patience of my colleagues back at REL Central and getting all the connections made. Uh, I am working away from, the, uh, from our office today and I'm actually on the campus of Southeast Missouri State University and later on in the presentation I'll give you more about the context of why I'm here and just how perfectly that fits into the comments by uh, colleagues earlier in the presentation. Um, as we move forward with the work in Missouri, uh, it goes back to 2010 and then actually in 2011 with the board approval, we developed a series of uh, model professional standards and quality indicators with a professional continuum. Uh, our state board approved these for teachers and leaders in 2011 and for librarians and counselors uh, in 2012. Uh, we introduced our new state standards, the Missouri Standards for the Preparation of Educators, MOSPE, in 2013. But the most important piece, those professional standards that were implemented in 2011, those provided the foundation from which we've been building for the past five or six years. Um, one of the key components uh, of our work is, uh, as we look at MOSPE standards, is the new student teaching requirements um, that fall under standard three. Those include uh, specific statewide formats, uh, rubrics, and training. And specifically, we're talking about university supervisors here. Several years ago with our work, uh, we went on the road because we had a work group of 120 people that helped us develop our MOSPE standards. And they were broken down into our six standards, of which number three is field and clinical. That group identified eight standards that we took on the road in a series of regional meetings back four years ago. And one of the questions that, are, that emerged out of that, and, and incidentally it happened right here at Southeast Missouri State in Cape Girardeau, one of the questions was should the preparation program supervisors use our Missouri uh, educator evaluation performance measures to evaluate student teachers. And that answer was resounding across the state in the, in the regional meetings we did at that time that that should be, that should be a cornerstone of our work, that we have a, would have a, con, a conversation about effective teaching all across the state of Missouri uh, using a statewide format that included rubrics and most importantly, the training of our university supervisors. Last year we had 591 university supervisors go through the training to implement our Missouri Educator Evaluation System. The Missouri Educator Gateway Assessments uh, was a series of assessments that we worked uh, to develop over the past three or four years. Uh, it, completes, it, completes, it includes a complete a series of assessments from admission all the way through uh, into the student teaching experience. We look at dispositions, uh, the soft skills, uh, general education and content, and then we implemented the Missouri Performance Teacher uh, Assessment. Uh, some of you may recognize the PPAT that's developed by ETS. Uh, this is uh, MOPTA was the first version of PPAT. We also have performance assessments in place for school counselors school librarians, and school leaders. We use the annual perform performance report for educator preparation programs to continually model our continuous improvement. Uh, that work began several years ago, and we continue to move forward this year with the development of APR 2016. <clears throat> we implemented new certification requirements in 2014, and uh, as uh, Stephen mentioned early on, or our other presenters that uh, were a proud member of the Cape State Alliance for Clinical Preparation because we truly believe uh, that this is the center. Uh, when we did our work earlier and began rolling out the, uh, our new requirements, uh, of the press that we talked with both locally and nationally, they always wanted to focus on the GPA piece and the new assessments. And we kept talking about the importance of standard three in field and clinical, but that didn't, that didn't gain any traction uh, with the public because it is the field and clinical experiences that are going to really make the difference in the development of our teachers 
over the uh, over a longer period of time. We identify real quick on the Missouri performance our, our first year teacher survey um, because we've been doing we've been doing this work since 2007. Uh, working with, of course, our department, but the Office of Social Economic Data Analysis, OCEDA, uh, on the University of Missouri campus. Uh, it became, this was an idea that came from our educator preparation programs about, let's, because they were not having much success in conducting their own beginning teacher surveys. So the question was, could we design one statewide and put it to use. So we began that first one for teachers was launched in 2007. The one for building principals was launched in 2009. That data is reported annually to our preparation programs. Uh, they have, uh, we did major revisions back in 2005 uh, with, or 2015. Those are aligned to our standards with, in, in the indicators the technical manual was published uh, last year that included the field test data and again the focus is on the overall preparation of our candidates. Um, matter of fact, we'll just be uh, getting ready to do a, uh, we just completed our survey, uh, our survey webinar where we released the information on the uh, results for 2016. Our annual performance report is identified on the next slide. Uh, this was work that we began in the spring of 2012. Uh, we rolled out our first technical and supporting data reports in 2013. And the APR 1.0 version uh, in 2014 actually gave us a proof of concept that we really had the right pieces together, at least at that point in our work, um, that could lead to the development and the publication of the report. Uh, also at that time, we, uh, we invested the time as long as our, along with our preparation programs and we had individual conferences with our um, preparation programs that uh, included the four-year recommending institutions. Um, and it was a great conversation as we sat around the table and went through the detail of the, of the technical and supporting data report that uh, led to, again, the development of the 1.0. Uh, our first release of, uh, of the APR 1.0 was in 2015. Uh, it was an internal release. And as we move forward um, with the first internal report of 2016, we're actually moving away from APR 1.0 and adding on to actually uh, implementing the 1.5 um, with, with the work uh, from MOTEP. We are fortunate we are in the second um, cohort with the National Teacher or Transforming Educator Preparation Programs. Uh, we refer to it as MOTEP. And um, we will have our first public, public release of our accountability plan, the APR, in this February in 2017. And while we're, while we're working on 1.5, we also are our committee that's working, uh, that includes PK-12 uh, teachers and leaders and our preparation program teachers or uh, faculty and leaders were already looking to the future and to what a 2.0 will look like. We began talking about where we are with the APR and the data points. The, pre, the APR that we've been running the last couple years included the file, included basically four year or four data points. Uh, grade point average of 2.5, which at this point was our, is our state requirement. Uh, that moves up to 3.0 next year. Uh, the scores uh, for the, either the Praxis 2 or as we rolled out new Missouri content assessments, um, the benchmark is 80% at the second attempt. And as I mentioned previously, we have our first year teacher and principal surveys where uh, in that we get the, the beginning teacher identifies uh, the quality of the preparation program and then the principal has a chance to uh, to reflect upon the quality of the preparation program that his beginning teacher or her beginning teacher program has completed. And that benchmark set at 90%. Uh, our new, new data with APR 1.5 that will be coming out uh, uh, in February will include, uh, and this is just going to be data reported, it will not have any benchmarks. Uh, it will include the scores of the Missouri Pre-Service uh, Pre Teacher Assessment, the MOPTA, 
and it will include the ratings from the Missouri Educator Evaluation System for cooperating teachers, uh, and then the building principal as well as program supervisors. We, uh, we know at this point that uh, our goal will be to uh, get everything collected from the cooperating teachers and the program supervisors. We continue to work. We have some of our building principals that understand the importance of them being involved and taking a look, a walk through to um, our candidates involved in student teaching. Uh, so that's other data that will be sporadic for this year, but uh, we'll be reporting it for the first time. But as we move toward APR 2.0, then we will, after a period of two or three years, probably closer to three, uh, we'll begin to talk about anticipated benchmarks um, for that work. This is, a, this is a busy year for us in the state, and in that a lot of the things we've been working on over the past three or four years uh, will come into play. It's a year of transition. Back, uh, back about a month ago, we hosted a meeting in, uh, in Columbia where we invited our preparation programs uh, to come, uh, including their leaders, li leaders, librarians, and counselor programs to be sure that everybody was on the same page with the transition. Um, and so we talked through all those different trans, trans, uh, transition pieces. The other thing is then we began to focus on the field and clinical. And in partnership, again, with the MOTAP and with CEDAR, uh, we're also in the last cohort with the CEDAR group. We've been conducting a series of cooperating teacher regional forums, and that's what brings me to Southeast Missouri State University today. Uh, on this campus, and this was the third of those forums, uh, we held one last, uh, last Friday. We had one of these in Kansas City area, the other one at Truman State in Kirksville, and today we're at uh, Southeast Missouri State, and tomorrow we'll be at Missouri State in Springfield. But this is the key because the goal is to listen to our cooperating teachers. We had about 15 cooperating teachers from Southeast Missouri that were engaged in the conversation. There was a series of prompts we asked them to respond to. These were open-ended response be responses because this is a listening tour. We are, we're going to learn a lot about the view of cooperating teachers and what they feel they need from our preparation programs and from, or from us as a state to help them do a great job in preparing the next generation of teachers. Of course, we're interested in seeing the initial guidelines for ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act. Uh, we understand and appreciate the expanding focus on clinical models. We've begun the discussion here about year-long residencies and or academies, including sustaining sustainable funding opportunities uh, brought to our attention from the uh, Bank Street College report that was issued back uh, several months ago. Several months ago. So uh, I'm very pleased today to have the opportunity to uh, represent my colleagues from across the state and emphasize the work um, that uh, they're about working to improve field and clinical in the state of Missouri. So Emma, we're back to you. So I'm going to turn it over now to um, Steve Meyer, who is going to introduce the research on field experiences in teacher preparation. Great. Thank you, Emma. Hi again. Um, so I'm just going to do a very quick overview, uh, if we can go to our next slide, um, of the research in uh, around field experiences before we get into talking about our study. Emma's going to come back and talk about the design and methodology of the study, and then I'll come back and talk about findings. Um, I just wanted, there's a lot of uh, information on this slide, uh, long definitions. Um, there's a lot of different types of use of terminology in teacher preparation, as many of you I'm sure know. Um, I, I just wanted to be clear that for the purposes of our study that we're talking about, we're using the term field experiences inclusively to include both student teaching and any other sort of activities that might happen as part of um, a field experience like observation, uh, tutoring, and so on. Um, we had initially uh, used the term clinical practice in the context of the study, uh, but some of the readers of the early drafts of the report felt like it was um, easy to confuse clinical practice with the idea of more intensive residency type programs, so um, we chose field experiences as sort of our catch-all term. So one of the things that's been a challenge uh, for a long time as 
different organizations and researchers have, have um, taken a look at the research that exists around teacher preparation is there's not a strong evidence base. There's not a lot uh, to inform kind of best practice or to make strong statements about what works in teacher preparation. Um, in terms of, you know, the first kind of research here that uh, relates program design and implementation to specific outcomes for students and teachers. And there's also not a whole lot of research that even just describes what current practice looks like. So, um, you know, it's difficult to have a sense, for example, um, within a state or across the nation about how things are happening. That's been a, you know, that's been a focus of some national organizations to try to get a handle on that, and it's very difficult. Um, and as I said, you know, in, the, in these re national reviews of research um, that have happened over the past uh, decade or two, there's been, you know, kind of the conclusion is there's not a lot to go on in terms of conclusive information about what works in teacher preparation. Um, but recently, as we'll see on the next slide, uh, there have been some more studies around this particular topic of field experiences. Um, when we first began to develop this study, we were looking, uh, we looked at the research and we wanted to be able to measure um, in Missouri what were those aspects of field experiences that the research had identified as important. And there are very, very few studies. In fact, the only study that um, we located that was a quantitative study that was didn't rely exclusively on qualitative data um, was this first one um, by Boyd and colleagues that was an analysis of data from New York City. And since then, since we developed the studies a few years back, there have been several more studies on this topic. So this is just a summary of some of the findings from these studies. Um, they tend to be analyses of large data sets. In a couple cases, they're from the Schools and Staffing Survey, which is a national data collection. There's a study, as I mentioned, New York City uh, schools and uh, some studies in Washington State as well. Um, but basically, you know, there's starting to be some more um, exclusive data, some sort of more rigorous uh, research-based evidence that um, elements of field experiences are important. And this, you know, I think it's hard to argue that um, these, ex these aspects of field experiences are important, but it's also reassuring to see that they're reflected in things that are highlighted in this slide. So things like student test score ga gains, um, uh, you know, perceptions of preparedness to teach, um, retention and teaching, ability to find a job, um, and effectiveness as a teacher in terms of value-added um, achievement measures and student achievement. So that's just a quick overview of uh, the research that's, um, uh, most of which has come out recently related to field experiences. And now we'll go back to Emma, who's going to give uh, some background on our study, and I'll come back to talk about some findings. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, so there were multiple purposes to developing this study in the first place. And first um, and foremost, really, to kind of start documenting the current practice. And that includes trying to document some of the variation within programs and then also between programs. Um, the second purpose here is the provision of a data collection tool that could be used um, to collect data from program graduates about elements that have been identified as important elements of clinical practice, which, um, based on a scan of the literature, really didn't necessarily exist before. And then also to provide a tool that could be adopted and or adapted for use in other settings, whether that's at the institution level or state level, this is something that could be utilized elsewhere. <clears throat> and we have talked a little bit about some of the standards that have been under development and the models that have been changing over the last few years and will continue to with their plan. And uh, the results from the study have the potential to inform conversations about the development of standards and practices around that as well. And then the study itself was able to, through the study we were able to provide confidential institution level reports back to the institutions who had a sufficient sample size to be included in the study. And these institution level reports were able to provide a means for these teacher preparation providers to really assess their own ratings relative to other states or to other pro providers in the state and potentially to monitor change in their practice over time if this survey were to be conducted over multiple years. Finally, another purpose of this study was to provide a data source that could be linked to teacher and student outcome data. Hap talked about the first year teacher survey that the state of Missouri collects 
annually. And if there's potential to link some of the data together to identify relationships among some of these elements of clinical practice and teacher preparedness overall, there's some really rich opportunities for continued study. The research was driven primarily by two research questions that you see on your slide here. First, what are the characteristics of field experiences in traditional teacher preparation programs completed by first-year public school teachers in Missouri? So that kind of identifies the scope for you of this project. I'll talk about the sample in a minute. And second, how do the field experiences in traditional teacher preparation programs um, vary by certificate type? So the report also disaggregates um, some information by certificate type, and so really kind of getting breaking it down a little bit further and understanding the descriptions of what's going on in the state. The survey was developed uh, using a multiple different resources. First, uh, it was based on some potentially important elements that were identified in research and professional standards. And to develop this um, framework and corresponding survey, researchers reviewed existing surveys of teacher preparation program graduates and focused on those that really measured elements of program implementation. And we did that in order to um, identify items that might work for the survey. And ultimately, several items were adopted, several were adapted to fit the framework that um, we were targeting, and then a few items were developed de novo in order to align with the framework and the elements of clinical practice that were identified. And then throughout survey development, feedback was incorporated from advisors from the Institute of Education Sciences and the rigorous uh, REL peer review process. And cognitive interviews were also conducted with a sample of first-year teachers to ensure the, the design of the survey met the needs of, um, of it, met its intentions and needs. So the framework is the elements of clinical of field experiences. Um, it's based on a, a number of different resources. The first one I'll mention is the study done by Boyd and his colleagues in 2009, which really found this relationship between student outcomes and participation in some of the elements of clinical practice, such as student teaching participation, oversight of the student teaching, links to practice, um, congruence with ultimate job assignments, and then also completion of capstone projects. So that kind of breaks down some of the elements of clinical practice already. And then there are a number of professional standards that were drawn from in order to identify the elements of field experiences that formed the basis for the framework. As you can see them listed here, um, the Association of College Teacher Educators has some standards on critical components of clinical preparation, and then the, a couple of the other ones are standards for teacher educators overall um, through the Association of Teacher Educators, and then uh, NCAPE, which is um, now CAPE, uh, had issued professional standards for accreditation of teacher preparation institutions that had some focus on field experiences and then student teaching standards as well were also incorporated. So the framework elements really broke down into six main categories, and then within each of these categories, there's more information included. So the resulting framework included characteristics, curriculum, and timing of field experience, the characteristics of cooperating teachers and supervisors, information about the partnerships and collaboration between institutes of higher ed and P12 schools, and then candidate evaluation and feedback, as well as information about the teacher preparation program evaluation. Uh, to elaborate a little bit on some of these, the, um, the characteristics, that first bullet point there, field experience characteristics, included things like the number of schools that were included in the field experiences, the number of classrooms, grade levels, time spent in student teaching, subject areas, um, an alignment of field experiences with courses, in addition to a, num a number of other elements. And um, both the cooperating teacher and supervisor characteristics were uh, looking at things like their knowledge for their 
either their subject domain or um, their understanding of goals and student needs. And essentially, were they good models and mentors for the students? And then supervisor characteristics also included things like effective instruction and communication. Um, so the, I'm going to show you a, a sample of the framework that kind of elaborates on these on the next slide, um, where you can see that there's information here included in the survey that's pretty extensive, including for things like the clinical placement characteristics. Are they of sufficient duration and intensity? Are they diverse? Are there multiple ones? And at the bottom, in the footnotes, you can see which of the standards each of these elements of the framework were drawn from. So this is really meant to be based on research that's out there and practice that's happening in order to make it the most um, comprehensive and accurate survey as possible. And um, so basically, each of the elements of the framework was aligned with standards as I as identified in the um, development of the framework. So the data for this descriptive study were collected during a 15-week period between late March and late June of 2015. Um, in order to collect the data, um, we were able to obtain a list of all of the practicing first-year teachers and pre-K through 12 teachers from uh, the Missouri Department of elementary and secondary education. So we really are um, grateful to them for their support of this, this project as well. The survey was primarily administered online, though in some of our follow-ups with non-responders, we did send paper copies as well. And the data collection was via um, email, snail mail, and phone calls in order to really get the highest response rate that we possibly could. And did a really great job of talking about why Missouri is a really good context for this, and the data collection collaboration, I think, um, speaks to that as well. Um, the analysis resulted in 856 survey respondents and 36 institutions. The response rate was 44% and non-response bias analyses were conducted um, to ensure that those who responded did not differ on basic demographic characteristics from those who did respond. And there were descriptive analyses that were provided for the state and institution level reports. Um, the nationally disseminated public report is the state level information. And as I mentioned earlier, the institution level reports were provided to each institution and were meant to be confidential and to provide them feedback about what's going on for them. And we did also analyze the data by certificate type and broke it down into early childhood, elementary, middle, and high school, and then also by subject area. I'm going to turn it over to Steve now to talk about what was found. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, so I'm going to try to go through these quite quickly. Um, the report, uh, which I mentioned, is, is publicly available for download and is free, um, has it's kind of everything you might want to know about the study. Um, we present in that report data at the national level, um, or sorry, at the Missouri level, and then we also disaggregate by uh, subject area and grade level certification type. Um, so there are some charts, which you'll see examples of coming up. Um, and then there's an appendix of the report that has really detailed information at the survey item level by those different certification areas. So I just wanted to mention the kind of big picture of what's in that report um, and to emphasize that we're just kind of hitting some highlights here and there's more there um, if you're interested. Um, this is just a quick overview of, um, you know, the total of participation, kind of what the uh, extent and duration of participation in field experiences look like. So all teachers reported participating in some field experiences, not surprising. Um, the average was four schools, six classrooms, at six grade levels, and in one non-school site, which might have been like a community center or an early childhood center, something like that. Um, and then most uh, candidates participated in student teaching. That was a little bit of a surprise because it's a requirement. There may have been a misunderstanding of the question here. Um, most of them were in more than one placement, and most of those who had more than one placement were in two placements. Um, and the average duration um, of student teaching was 16 weeks. Uh, and, and as Hat mentioned, you know, the state requirement um, is 12 weeks, so this is a little bit higher than expected, and I think reflects um, some of the work that's been underway at, at programs in Missouri. Um, also, the total estimated average hours, 631, is a little higher than 
some national estimates of hours spent in student teaching. So uh, this gives you a sense of kind of what some of the charts in the report look like. Um, I think I'm going to go through them very, very quickly, but just to give a sense, I mean, for the, you know, on the, on, on the whole, most of the readings from, uh, and again, these are first-year teachers at the end of their first year of teaching, reflecting on um, the experiences they had uh, in student teaching other field experiences, um, were quite positive. So in this case, the blue bars, um, so black is not at all, gray is a little, light blue is somewhat, and uh, the darker blue is a lot. And these questions are about alignment with um, career teaching plans and first teaching positions. Um, according to the subject area, grade level, and student population characteristics for each. So just based on the amount of blue in there, you know, the, the majority of first-year teachers are reporting that the alignment was somewhat or a lot in both these cases, a little less alignment with first teaching position. And this is about, you know, Emma mentioned that we looked at um, satisfaction with cooperating teachers and supervising faculty members, and we asked about their knowledge, um, how effective they were as a mentor, for example, the kind of feedback they gave. And again, there's a fairly positive picture here. The, Light blue uh, of the bars in this case refers to agreement. Either uh, you know, lighter blue is agreement, and darker blue is strongly strong agreement. And then the gray and black are strong disagreement and disagreement. Um, so essentially, just on the whole, again, you know, uh, more than half of teachers are strongly agreeing with these characteristics that standards identify as important for cooperating teachers and supervising faculty members. And this is about uh, the frequency of um, observation and feedback during field experiences. So um, the blue is the most uh, frequent. It, it uh, corresponds to daily. And then the darker color is less than once, or the black is less than once per month or never. Um, so we're seeing you know, much more engagement of cooperating teachers in observation and feedback, which isn't surprising. Um, many of the activities are happening daily. Uh, for, for most of the teachers. Uh, written feedback happens a little less frequently uh, from cooperating teachers. And then we see a difference, again, which is not terribly surprising, but the um, supervising faculty member who's less, you know, sees uh, the candidate less often um, during field experience uh, is less engaged in these activities. Um, the, the largest black bar on there is the frequency with which um, the supervising faculty member's teaching was observed by the candidate. So that's something that's happening least often here. All right, and this is, um, these are, again, uh, a component identified in standards as important in field experiences is kind of um, what the field experience school is like. So these are the things that showed up in the standards um, that we reflected in the survey. Um, collegiality of teaching staff, for example, um, the effectiveness of the principal procedures for student discipline. And again, these are quite positive. There's either agreement or a strong agreement among the vast majority of um, teachers on most of these. The bottom bar is about um, parent and family involvement, and that's one where there was um, a little more disagreement, you know, about over a quarter of first-year teachers reported that they disagreed that parent and family uh, involvement was strong. Um, and that's something that will come up in a later slide, you know, uh, engaging candidates in um, with parents and families is something that I think is a persistent challenge in programs and something that um, organizations like Kate, for example, are trying to build some capacity around. Uh, so this is about alignment of the field experiences with what was learned in preparation program courses. Um, so this is how often uh, teachers during their field experiences were doing things like trying strategies for techniques they learned in courses, applying the subject matter they learned in courses, and applying pedagogy. Um, these things are happening fairly often. So the darkest blue bars refer to often or always or almost always, and then the lighter blue is occasionally. So again, you know, a majority is doing, a majority of teachers is doing these activities often or always or almost always. Um, but for example, on the bottom bar um, shows us that, you know, a little more than a quarter of, of responding teachers said that they never, or almost never, rarely or occasionally have pedagogy learning courses. So there's some room for you. Okay, and this is our, I think, our most dense slide. Um, there's kind of a lot going on here, but it's a, there's a mix of, um, the frequency with which teachers worked with uh, students from varied cultural backgrounds, um, used computers for instruction, and used a variety of classroom management strategies. So I won't say a whole lot here other than just to kind of note that there's a little more variation when we get down to this, this level. Um, some of the, you know, for example, the third bar down talks about um, frequency with which teachers uh, worked with students with varied levels of English proficiency, and I think that's 
you know, in Missouri is a factor of where um, you do your student uh, teaching placement and, you know, the extent to which English language learners are available. Uh, um, and I think this may be our last one. This is, um, this is basically, so one of the things that's important and I think is uh, reflected in, in uh, Christian and Christie's comments is this um, partnership between the program and the field experience schools is really an essential component of this of this work, and um, it's reflect, it is reflected as, in all of the professional standards around field experiences. So we asked, um, you know, first-year teachers to reflect, kind of to uh, provide their perspective on these things. So the extent to which they they agreed that um, you know the expectations were communicated uh, by the program to the field experience schools. Um, the extent to which expertise was shared across um, among faculty and staff across programs and the field experience schools. And then um, the third one is around whether the property teacher and supervising faculty member um, from the educator prep program work together as a team. Typically, this is an example of um, an institution report. Um, Emma and Hap both mentioned that we, you know, when we had enough data for a given uh, institution, we we provided them with a confidential report. Of you can see in the first column there's sort of the links. In the second, there's the um, results for the rest of the state, and the last column shows the difference. Each row in these tables, and this is just a, a sample. I think there were maybe two in total in each report. Um, we what we did is just highlight the differences that um, that met a threshold. I think it was if it was a greater than five percent difference, and if it was negative, it was in red, and if it was positive, it was in green, and um, the idea here was just to highlight areas, you know, that seem to be emerging as strengths or weaknesses for a given program, and inform discussions um, at the program level about, you know, where they where they might want to have discussions about um, making changes or maybe look at these issues a little more closely. So just a couple of kind of summary comments based on the findings, and I went through that quickly, and I also highlighted some sample findings. But um, as I mentioned, uh, student teaching duration was more than expected by state standards and more than national averages. Uh, there was a lot of variation. There were some surprisingly low and surprisingly high reports of like hours spent during student teaching. Um, uh, as I mentioned, strong alignment of field experiences with career teaching plans and first teaching assignments. And again, there was some variation across certificate types. Um, if that's and by the way, if variation across certificate types is of interest to you, that I direct you to the report because there's a lot more information there. Um, basically, quite positive. Uh, perceptions of field experience schools and lower uh, ratings of parent community interaction. There was quite a bit of observation and feedback from uh, cooperating teachers that happened frequently. It was less frequent uh, among supervising faculty members. Um, again, good alignment of field experience with courses, but some areas for improvement. Um, one of those areas was around, um, uh, had to do with parent involvement. So I think there was a, uh, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, there was an item about course coverage of sort of how to engage with parents and there was something you know, that was an opportunity that candidates didn't have so often in their student teaching and field experiences. And then finally, um, as I mentioned in the last slide, the uh, ratings of partnerships were generally positive, slightly lower for kind of the joint involvement in designing field experiences and selecting cooperating teachers. Possible next steps, Emma um, hit on some of these, but um, some, you know, we had an opportunity to share these data with uh, deans of educator preparation programs in Missouri, and some of them were interested in continuing to collect these data annually. There's um, the potential to link these data with some other data to look at uh, whether um, different aspects of field experiences might be less, more or less important for um, teachers' ratings of preparedness, for example. Uh, other possibilities are looking at some other um, analyses that disaggregate this, these data based on the kinds of uh, programs that are out there. And then finally, considering first-year teaching experiences and how they may affect the uh, perceptions of teachers, the perceptions that teachers have about their training. This is my thank you slide, just to acknowledge everybody who was involved in this project. Um, most of all, first-year Missouri teachers who took a, um, you know, endured our uh, follow-up activities and took a long survey at the end of a, <laughs> one of their undoubtedly most challenging years. Um, and just thank you to the um, Missouri Department of Ed and, and uh, the various folks who were involved in reviewing and putting this together. But I'm going to actually move forward and let Christian and Christy talk and share um, some of their thoughts on critical field experiences. Kind of amazing, just the amount of information that you're gathering about um, what currently exists in Missouri in particular. I think Christy and I, uh, again, feel really fortunate that um, what we're 
I, really what we're highlighting today is not just the national context, but, but also how are we answering um, some of uh, the, the current needs for field experiences. Like we're, we get to consider what do our, our students, what are pre-service teachers, what do mentor teachers and young people actually need. So um, as we, we've noted throughout, the research has just demonstrated and you've just proved it that field experiences play a, a significant part in uh, developing future teacher, teachers' pedagogies, their orientations to the profession, and even their persistence in their future classrooms. Um, what we know is that it's critical that teacher educators, uh, folks like Chrissy and myself, that we focus our efforts on conceptualizing really innovative and effective ways to engage pre-service teachers in these experiences. So uh, what we're going to share here looks quite a bit different than a lot of the traditional models. While a lot of us scholars, practitioners, and policymakers are calling for this pivot, um, we are actually engaging uh, alongside with school-based teacher educators, pre-service teachers, and young people in what we think is a really promising example of this rethinking. And it's what we're, we're calling critical project-based clinical experiences. So as we, as we think about these types of field experiences, and this was alluded to before, but we have many conversations around pre-service teachers' experiences in field experiences. We have conversations about faculty and how we navigate roles, and we have scholarship and conversations about what school-based teachers are doing. And yet we tend to leave out our student voice. And so really at the heart of a critical project-based field experience is students and their needs as learners and their strengths as learners. And, and our goal is really to challenge the status quo, um, the entrenched ideas that we have about adolescents and their schooling. And so what we are calling critical project-based clinical field experiences are really designed to challenge pre-service teachers' beliefs about schools, about students, about communities, as well as to think about how they're going to teach students um, and how they're going to design responsive instruction. And this very much is oriented to a social justice approach. This recognition also that there are classroom teachers who should be viewed as school-based teacher educators and that, again, um, this cannot exist without a partnership between all of us. So just a little bit more uh, information, kind of backdrop of these experiences. They do something really unique and powerful. They intentionally position everyone, us, Chrissy and myself, school-based teachers and teacher educators, pre-service teachers, and even young people, as Christy mentioned, as co-teachers and co-learners. What that does is um, creates opportunities for all of us to actively, intentionally uh, in, engage in uh, professional development and really to learn from each other. That sounds like a lofty ideal, but it's actually something that um, we get to enact and we see, we see happening on, a, on virtually a daily basis as well. Authenticity and contextualized problem solving are core features of this work, and they're rooted in short-term intensive engagements in actual classrooms. So we're we're um, they're they're limited in in scope and in time, um, but they're um, but they're rich during during that time. The and, uh, as well, I mean, just a, I think the last piece of sort of the backdrop to this is that we we have an explicit overarching goal. Um, to engage everyone involved, young people, pre-service teachers, veteran teachers, you know, who are school-based teacher educators and us, in what we would call literacies and collaboration um, in and amongst all these constituents with, a, an ex, a, a, I guess, a candid eye, an explicit eye towards schools' civic, democratic, and civil ends. So one example um, is writing our lives and um, the goal is thinking about how we teach writing and how writing is definitely a social practice that can position youth as creative meaning makers. And so pre-service teachers work with uh, youth at a juvenile detention center, the teachers at the detention center, faculty, to really think about um, how we can reconceptualize writing instruction and really live in and act the best practices around the writing workshop and what that means to uh, really position youth as writers um, and who identify themselves as writers. The, another example um, is uh, a project that what, uh, at 
Mason that we call Picturing Good Teaching. It's uh, one that we implement, have implemented um, multiple times in multiple schools. It's a three-week intensive field-based elective for pre-service teachers. The mo in the most recent iteration, we worked with 20 teacher candidates in the, uh, the secondary education program that I coordinate. We worked with three populations of students, the elementary, middle, and high school. And the idea was that, that these folks, these pre-service teachers, should work with uh, mentor teachers and the um, young people, not just who they're going to work with in the near future as their teachers, but also with the, the, who those young people were and, and, and you know, prior to arriving in the high school classroom. Each young, as a part of this project, each, each pre-service teacher engaged with and really mentored one or two young, young people in each of these sites, elementary, middle, and high school, and called on them to use uh, digital images and reflections to illustrate and describe what they believe about exceptional teaching and it, using a, a photo voice method that I've devised. The, um, these folks also, the preservers teachers, also interviewed teachers in each of these settings for their responses to the same question about what is exceptional teaching. And they ultimately, the preservers teachers, produced summary presentations, just PowerPoints generally, of insights from young people and veteran practitioners. Earlier, we discussed student learning and how we really foreground student learning. And, and the critical project-based field experiences are really rooted in very specific goals for instruction. And so that is very much the foremost, is that pre-service teachers, faculty, and school-based teachers are asking questions about instruction and then honoring students' voices within thinking about what instruction looks like. And, and we see this as a, a way to navigate the tensions of possibilities and realities in classrooms. And our just last sort of consideration of these experiences, um, just a, a few thoughts. We know now from uh, actually implementing these projects over several years already, is that these sorts of experiences, this sort of an orientation, challenges all of the constituents of the teacher, edu teacher education equation across schools and universities to make the continued learning about the other parties in these exchanges a central feature. It's back to that relationship piece. And that's just based on the idea that teaching and learning is always first about teaching people to learn content and skills which unfortunately still remains something of a novel orientation for too many educators, and I mean teacher educators and classroom teachers. These projects also shift many assumptions about whose voices should be heard in our teacher education efforts, and something Christy really highlighted. We position young people as among the experts on the training and professional development of educators across the continuum and across our ins educational institutions, which is really sort of a, another radical turn. These projects also intentionally provide all schools' con constituents, again, we know the list, uh, with opportunities to learn what uh, Marilyn Cochran Smith would call learning how to teach against the grain. Um, we see that as, as a core feature of, of, of our work. And finally, and perhaps most importantly for us, we turn to this innovation um, because uh, we recognize that as teacher educators, university-based folks, we really needed new and more compelling reasons for our very profession to exist. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't hope this doesn't sound self-congratulatory, but um, I think we, we feel that, we see that on a daily basis through these sorts of projects. Thank you so much to um, all of the presenters, TAP and Steve and Christy and Christian. It's uh, been a really fascinating discussion and I've really enjoyed it. I hope our audience members have too. I'm sure they have.